Okay, first scripture, Deuteronomy 28, reading from verse 9. Moses writes this, If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord, and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to give your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless all the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you'll always be on the top. What are we starting with? We're starting with a promise that God has established his people as the head and not the tail. And we've got to hold on to this. We've got to anchor ourselves in what the promises of God are. Are you guys okay? Is anyone else a little bit nervous about what God might want to do tonight? No? Just me. Okay. Um, But what I'm trying to do is to set a platform of Scripture at the beginning, so I'm setting you up for what God wants to do. Is that okay? You're You're allowing yourself to be set up? Okay. All right. So the first Scripture's all good. Let's look at the second Scripture from Isaiah 61. This will be well known to... Many, many people, but this is something that um, God really spoke to me uh, a few years ago, uh, specifically around finances, if I could say that, specifically around finances for those um, that want to be set free. So Isaiah writes in Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1 and reading the first seven verses, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. We'll talk about that in a minute. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he'll give crown of beauty for ashes, joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks the Lord has planted for his own glory. They, meaning the people of God, will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. It's a promise for restoration in there for someone. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants, and they will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. Anyone else want to say amen to that? That's a good promise for us to receive. These scriptures are anchoring us in God's truth and what he has given us as promises. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. He's he's having a, a sermon on a hill and reading from verse 25. Jesus says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? You're going to see why that scripture is important later on tonight. Can't you see that you are far more valuable to God than the birds are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. This is awesome. So why do you have so little faith? Says Jesus. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. 
live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. The point is, regardless of what we see, Jesus is saying the Father will take care of you. These are, these are promises we must anchor in our spirit. And finally, just to set a foundation, Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. For God, Paul writes, God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Hmm, that's good. That's only the first one. The second verse. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Oh, I can't help it. I've got to read the next verse. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So people's needs are met, and God is glorified through our generosity, which is enabled by God anyway. Okay. We want to anchor ourselves in Scripture, and may the Word of God as it's spoken open your heart to receive what God has tonight. We read that this morning, you know, and Paul was in Macedonia, as he spoke, uh, Lydia's heart was opened, and she received the revelation. So scripture, may the scriptures tonight that I've read open your heart so that you might receive what God is asking you to step into. You all right? Okay. Are you expectant? Okay. Let me just quickly paint a picture of what I think God would say to us around financial freedom. As we were preparing this week, uh, we, as we do, we sit around a whiteboard and we, we brainstorm with God. And uh, we asked, well, what does financial freedom look like? And these are the points that I felt God uh, uh, gave us because they ended up on the whiteboard. The first one is liberty. Liberty means no bondage. And tonight we are specifically going after bondage. Bondage is a Christianese kind of word. If you're not used to it or not sure what that means, just imagine a picture of being wrapped up in chains and not being able to move. That's what bondage is. And bondage is created in a number of different ways. I'm going to talk about that tonight. I don't know if you watched the videos that I put on Facebook, but I talked about specific types of bondage that binds people and locks them and restricts them and prevents them from being the person that God's called them to be, whether it's in their normal work, whether it's in their family, or whether it's in their finances. Specifically tonight, we're talking about finances. But I want to remind you, when I speak about liberty... I want to remind you what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 61. We just read it. He said, liberty to the captives and the prisoners will be freed. What's the difference between a prisoner and a captive? Prisoner is held in bondage because they did something wrong. Does that make sense? A prisoner goes before a court, gets judged guilty, and is put in prison. Therefore, they are in prison because they did something wrong. But Isaiah said, not only will the prisoner be freed, but the captive will be set free. What's a captive? Someone that has been taken into captivity by someone else. So think about the Old Testament picture, because this is the context for Isaiah's um, speaking to his audience. They were... They were the Jews, particularly the people from Jerusalem, the Israelites, they were taken captive, weren't they? So remember the king would march into Jerusalem, siege the city, and he would get the royal people, the good-looking ones, the intelligent ones, and the ones from the royal family, and he would take them captivity back to Babylon. Remember? You do remember? Just nod. Just help me out. Feedback. Okay. So the point is, some of your problems, you're a prisoner. You're in prison and bondage because you did something wrong. That's not criticism or judgment. That's pointing to the problem. If we can find the problem and point to it, we can fix it. But some of you are in captivity, not because of what you've done, but what's been done to you or before you. Big difference. 
We've got to use a different solution for different situations. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to take you through everything. As quickly, but as efficiently as I can, but also just as a warning, God spoke in the prayer meeting to say we shouldn't rush because I don't want to minimize what God wants to do tonight. So we'll move at his speed, okay? But a key point is liberty comes when we are set free from what we have done as mistakes in the past. That's a promise. We don't stay prisoners, do we? No, we are set free by the completed work of Jesus Christ. So if we've made a mistake tonight, we will get set free. But if we're in bondage because of something that's happened to us or around us that we're not aware of or we couldn't influence or affect, God says, don't worry, still, I'm going to set you free anyway. Okay? All right. Financial freedom also looks like sonship. I spoke about this this morning, specifically just to get rid of all jargon. Sonship means we understand and accept and walk and live as if we are sons of God. Or if you're a lady, a daughter. And we're going to specifically establish that in everyone tonight. Not that you don't, you're not that you're not saved. It's not that you haven't said the prayer of salvation or been walking with Jesus for a long time, like many of you have. It's not the point. The point is, am I walking in a revelation of sonship? Do I walk and live as a son of the king? All right, so that's what freedom and liberty looks like. And we're going to go after that tonight to help establish it in your life. Thirdly, stewardship. What is stewardship? Good, biblical, wise use of the resources that you're trusted with. One of the parables that gives me the fear of the Lord is the parable of the talents. Because whatever God has given me, he will ask me and expect me to present an account for what he's given me. You are no different. If God has blessed you with much or with little, you will be held accountable for what you've done with what you've been given. Now, I've spent years and years and years and years teaching people in financial seminars. We are not going to do that tonight. But we have talked about doing one in two weeks. Just a simple, basic financial stewardship seminar that is practical things that you can do with your money. But many, many people that I've helped over the 20 years I've been in, the, in, the, in that part of my life, they've just been in trouble because they've just done dumb stuff. And, and half the reason is because they were never taught. So, again, we're not trying to blame anyone here. We're just saying there are simple things we can learn to be good stewards, which is what financial freedom looks like. But the reason we've done it this way, and I shared this this morning, is the Lord said to us, well, you can't expect people to have good behavior if you haven't set them free on the inside first, which is why we're doing tonight. So freedom on the inside tonight changes our behavior on the outside. Okay? Okay. Fourthly, what does uh, uh, financial freedom look like? Generosity. And the revelation from this morning's message was that um, when, we, when we have a revelation of who God is and we repent truly as we saw in the Scriptures this morning, then the outflow of that is that we, we are generous and generous with our time and our service and our life and our talents and our finances. And again, we're in the middle of a financial session, financial season, financial teaching series, so we are hitting that one. All right, it's just a byproduct of who God and how God designed us. And finally, I don't want to labor this one because we're not going to spend much time on it tonight, but one of the things that we, that's been a revelation from the teaching, especially this morning, is that God always calls us into community. Think about Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. Peter preached the message. People responded because their hearts were pierced. They said, what should we do, brothers? They said, repent and be baptized and, and declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And they did that, and then they formed a community. And they did life together. And they shared what they had together. And there was no one in need, and they gave money to the poor if they needed it. And I said to you this morning, those of you that are here, you can listen to the podcast, but I call community, another name for community is common union. That's where we get the word communion from. Common union, meaning living together and doing life together, and it's a a byproduct of a redeemed community. Specifically in Acts chapter 2 we see it, but then this morning we looked at Acts chapter 16. And we saw it happen in Lydia's household. She got saved, baptized, uh, responded to the message, and then she invited them into her home to share a meal. Come and share a meal with us. Be part of our community. Be part of our family. Common union. Same with the jailer. Jailer is uh, responding to the message. He cares for their wounds. He says, let's all get baptized. Everyone in the house, come on, let's do it. 
And then she, he said, now that you're in my home, let me take care of you. Let me feed you. Common union. So one of the, I think, one of the, one of the um, key pieces of evidence for a redeemed community that's walking in freedom is the way they do life together. And we're a long way down that path, which is good. Okay? All right. So what I'm trying to do is anchor us in Scripture. I'm trying to give us a picture of what freedom looks like, but now we have to look, work out what freedom doesn't look like, which I've just called for the sake of the slide, spiritual financial bondage. These are issues that get caught up in us uh, through life or through experience or through things we do or things that are done to us, and they, and they cause problems, and, and they just become like junk in our closet. And they, they inhibit us and they restrict us in how we're living in accordance with the way God wants us to live. And so these are the five that I spoke about in the videos that I shared this week. Um, fear, which is being afraid. Loss of control, which is having things done to you or around you and not being able to change your world. Three, greed or mammon. And I did speak about that in this morning's message and gave a wee testimony on that. Fourthly, being hidden or being obscure or missing out or not, not walking in opportunity like others do. And finally, I call this video um, on, the, on the social, Patterns of Failure. And one of the things that is frustrating, I'm sure, if it's happening to you, but it's something that I've experienced in helping and coaching people in this area of life, is that people just say, look, I always come up against the same problem, and then I... I sort of get through it, and I work hard, and then bang, I come up against the same problem. And it's kind of like a repeat or a cycle. And they're like, why is that? And I'm like, well, there's a reason for that. We've just got to dig into the spiritual reason that's the bondage that's causing this repeat pattern of failure. Because doing the same old thing to get the same old result, there's a name for that, and we won't go into it, but we want to break the pattern of failure. So one of the things... Are you guys okay? Sorry, I should check in. I'm just, I'm marching through this, but I just want to, are we all still okay? Are you with me? No one's jumping off the bus yet? Okay. Are you excited about what God might do in your life? Hey? I'm excited about what he might do in our community. Because what happens if a whole bunch of people get set free from bondage? Come on, we might change our town. Oh, here's a thought. Fancy that. Huh, okay. Some of you are excited. <laughs> okay. Now, this is where you might get a little scared, because when I sat down um, to try and wrap things together in order to present it to you, I actually realized there are nine tools for freedom that I could use. And I'm like, oh, that's a scary number, because it's a long list. And then I felt, well, which ones do I cut out? And then I felt I had to say, well, who would I miss out? So all nine are in. And, um, and, and don't worry, it's not like having teeth pulled. You'll be okay. But here's the thing. Like, in my journey uh, professionally and, and in ministry before I became a pastor, I would spend a lot of energy on this. And so I have literally, and I don't say this in any grandiose way for pride or any other reason, I'm saying this to be honest, I have traveled the world to study this. I have chased after people who are experts in this field so that I can sit with them, so I can sit under their teaching, so that I can minister alongside them, so that I can receive the impartation of the gift and the grace that they carry. I have spent thousands of dollars doing that and invested a lot of time away from my family in order to study this. And I say that to express how committed I am to each person finding freedom in their situation. Does that make sense? So, so like I, when I would sit with people one-on-one or when I would teach this in a seminar, I've got to understand that I've got a whole wide range of people and situations. So just to pick one or two things and hope that it works isn't going to do the audience justice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through all nine, and we're going to sort of wander through what God's given me to do, and some of it is going to be relevant to you, and some of it won't be, and that's Okay. But what I'd recommend you do is you take hold of every single step. And if it's, if it's not a big deal in your family, then sweet, you're just going to glide through it. But some of these will be specific for your situation, your history, or your future. And that's the one that's going to impact you the most. 
and this is what I felt God say in the prayer meeting before you all came, is that I needed to be very sensitive to what God is doing and not rush through this because of the clock. Is it okay? Because in my experience, when we start getting into these things, God is going to minister in his spirit directly into your situation where you're sitting. And that's a good thing. That is not something to be afraid of because God only touches what he wants to heal and God only does what he knows you're ready for. Okay? So I'm going to be sensitive to that, but I want you to be sensitive to that because we're a family. And if someone around you or close to you looks like they're struggling with something, go and sit with them. Support them. Knowing that God is doing the work, you don't have to. Okay? All right. Is everyone okay? Do we need to wriggle or stand up or wave? Are you okay? All right. All right. I talked about this this morning, and I'm starting with it on purpose. Oh, oh, by the way, I must say this. When we talk about issues and finances, we could spend a lot of time talking about the problems. And I can uh, point to either by prophetic discernment or just word of knowledge or just common sense or what the problems are in your life. But I didn't want to do that. Because then that's like calling out the warts and the issues. We'd rather just talk about the solutions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through the nine tools for freedom, which are the solutions to a wide range of problems. And when I just looked at the, the list I had on my desk and I walked through uh, what I knew God wanted to do, I was comfortable that these tools are what you need to address the kinds of problems that I've talked about during the week. Okay? So we're just talking to the positive as solutions to deal with situations that are personal. The first one is peace. The first tool for you to have in your toolbox is peace. One of the scriptures that I shared this morning, actually, can someone find it for me in the, in the NIV? I'll get you guys so you make sure you're awake. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 in the NIV. Who wants to grab that? You want to read it out? Are you giving it to me? You don't want to read it? Okay. You have a messenger notification. (laughs) It's Jackson. Kids. Okay, Isaiah 26 verse 3. You, God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast Because they trust in you. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Peace is, thank you, peace is a key for all of us that we actually have to go after. And then when we get it, we have to protect it because it's one of the main things that the enemy would like to steal from you. In my situation, in my experience, One of the things that I've noticed is that when I'm going through a challenging season, the enemy, the devil, who's like a lion, is prowling, looking for someone to devour. And he usually does that at three in the morning. So it's very common for me, when I'm going through a challenging season, to get woken at 3 a.m. And all of a sudden, I'm anxious and worried, and often fearful of the situation I'm facing. There was times in business I spoke about earlier, um, the Lord did some correcting in me. Well, that was just such a calamity that I was so far in a hole I couldn't even see the bottom. That's how deep I was. And in that season, I had people chasing me for large sums of money. And I would literally wake up in a cold sweat at three in the morning, having a panic attack almost. Because fear was just gripping me and shaking me and rippling through my body like an electric charge. Now, what is that? That's the devil. The devil is like a lion prowling, seeking whom he may destroy. And he attacks people at three in the morning or four in the morning because he knows that's when you're at your weakest. Are you interceding for yourself at three in the morning? No, you're not. You're purring like a thousand kittens. 
Some of us are. <laughs> What's my point? You have to guard your peace. You have to protect your heart. What does the scripture say? God will give you that perfect peace whose minds are stayed on him and who trust in him. So what's your offense against anxiety? What's your offense against fear? I fix my mind on him who saves me. I submit myself to him and trust him. And I would ask him to give me his peace. It's a simple prayer, but it's a very powerful tool. When you pray that one verse at three in the morning and you stand up to the devil, he must flee. It sounds simple. I mean, I don't know if you want to put up hands, but like when I say you get attacked at three in the morning, does anyone have a clue what I'm talking about? Okay. (laughs) All right. Peace is your first tool, and it might come for any number of, the attack might come for any number of reasons, but the Bible says, when I fix my mind steadfastly on him, he will grant me peace, and peace is powerful, and I'm giving you these ones first, because they are anchors, you can use this in most situations, all right, it might not be a middle of the night attack, it might be a meeting that you have to walk into with your boss, or one of your staff members, well, yep, Ash, tomorrow. Um, <laughs> oh, fear just came in the room. Let's get it out. <laughs> You're, you can do that. Can you do that? What's the verse? That's right. Okay. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Who wants to find that one? Just make, I do this to make sure everyone's awake. You've got a Bible on your phone, right? Okay. It's good to read your Bible, isn't it? Oh, it's even better if you like read it in church. It encourages the pastor. Yes, Gary. Why don't you read it out? So there's another verse that you could memorize for that middle of the night response. Be anxious for nothing. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Peace is a very powerful weapon. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Who wants to find that one? Anyone? Yes. Oh, you can do the next one. Oh, that would take twice as long to read. Yes, Eugene. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Again, same message. Cast your anxiety means to give it over. Most of the the permission that the devil gets, you give him. And so if you're holding on to this thing and wrestling with him, he's going to have a fight with you. But if you cast your anxiety on who? On him, God. So you cast your anxiety on him, he will give you peace. Okay, so God, this thing I'm worried about, I'm giving it to you. Name it and hand it over. The devil's got no target. Okay, the last one, or maybe the last one, maybe not the last one. Psalm 29 verse 11. Who's got Psalm 29 verse 11? Someone else. The Lord will give strength to his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. Okay, and the last one, Jesus said in John 16, verse 33.
So here, here the key, key end of that verse. Jesus says, you've got peace. But listen to the end of the verse. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Huh. So we can be worried about everything. And Jesus says, huh, I overcame the world. So do you want to rest in what he's done or what you're wrestling with? I, I say it lightly. I know it's not easy. But the point is, the first, first thing in our toolbox has to be peace, to find stability in order to walk into what God's got for us. Because this one here, this is just a minor battle. If you can get this one, you can deal with the big stuff. But we've got to get this one first. Okay? All right, let's look at the second key that I've, um, I've put up here, and that's the spirit of adoption. And so this is, um, I would like, Jan, if you could find this in your Amplified Bible, I, I referred to it last night, Romans 8, verse 14. I referred to it this morning, but I didn't have time to read it. But I read it again this afternoon. I'm like, nah, we've got to speak this out loud for it to catch our hearts. Okay? I'll give you the microphone. Hang on. You got it? Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are allowing themselves to be led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear of God's judgment, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. That is the spirit producing sonship by which we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God, and if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, that is sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance, if indeed we share in his suffering, so that we may also share in his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So this, this spirit of adoption is what I refer to as a way we live or a perspective we have. And, you know, it's, it's in the scripture, it's easy, you've probably heard that, that a million times, but what does it look like in your life? How are you living as a son of God Most High? If you imagined yourself living in a palace, having access at any time of the day or night to the king in the palace, and that you could walk into the treasury and have access to all the king's resources, that you could walk out to the army that the king owned or controlled and have them at your beck and command, how would you live your life? That's the reality of the spirit of adoption the spirit of sonship, where we would cry, Abba, Father. We'd cry out, Papa. We'd cry out, Daddy. We'd say, God, you are my Father. That's kind of a a mindset that we need to train ourselves in. This is a discipline of way of thinking. I've put up here, we must see God as our Father. We must see Him as a Father who protects us. We must see as a Father who provides for us. We must see God as a Father who calls us child. So the next time you look at a money issue, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember this, and maybe we'll make the slides available on the podcast for you, but the point is this, God, you're my father, and you call me your son or daughter. God, I see you as my provider, which means all these bills here, you want to help me with, with your wisdom. You are also the one who protects me. So God, I'm declaring that as my father, you want to protect me from the attack of any enemy that would come against me. Those of us that are fathers would know, and and, and actually, to be honest, mum's no different, we'd fight for our kids, wouldn't we? But isn't God the same? More so. So next time you face a challenge or you've got a financial obstacle, or you've got an issue that you don't know how to deal with, say, God, I'm seeing you as my father. I'm confessing that you're the God who provides for me. I'm confessing that you're the God who protects me, and that you're a father who calls me child. One of the um, prayer tools that we use in ministry is we would ask someone to close your eyes. And we'll do this now. So if you want to, if you trust, if you trust the, the space we're in, just close your eyes. You can do this with your eyes open. If the person next to you is snoring, give them a nudge. And, and um, we're going to close our eyes and we want to say, 
we want to just listen to my prayer and then you do it in your, in your, in your quiet space. But that I would pray this. I'd say, Father God, would you show me a picture of how much you love me? Or I'd say, Father God, would you show me a picture that reminds me you are my Father? And as I, as I say that in my prayer time, I'm expecting God to speak to me or to show me something in my mind's eye or my imagination. I am a visual person, so I see pictures. It's how my brain works. It's how I think. Some people get words or scriptures or memories. But just in this moment, before I move on, just ask, Father God, would you show me a picture of how much you love me? Father God, would you remind me, give me something that reminds me, you are my Father. Some of you will be getting something that you're struggling with because it's against what you believe or it's what, against what you're used to. And I'm going to deal with that in a minute because I'll give you some more tools. But one of the things that I train people to do in this area is I train them to respond this way. Let's just say, uh, I'm going to make something up. Let's just say I just saw a picture of me and God sitting in a car, driving along the beach, having a chat on a sunny day. And most of you know I love cars, I love sunshine, and I love being with people. So for me, that's a picture of intimacy in a way that speaks to me personally. All right. So let's just say that's what I saw in my mind's eye just then. Then I would say this, and this is what I'm training you to do. I choose to receive that as God's truth for me. The language is very important. It's deliberate. I choose, I'm making a deliberate choice. I choose to receive that as God's truth for me. All right? So even if everything in you is fighting it because you don't actually know why God would want to hang out with you, I'll deal with that in a minute. But learning to say, I choose to receive that as God's truth for me is learning to receive his love in practical ways. Okay? You got it? Locked it in? Okay. Spirit of adoption is tool number two. Number three, removing offenses. This is something that we spoke, uh, I, someone spoke to me about this morning, so I've put it in here because it's a very powerful thing. Often in our life, a grudge or something we're holding that we didn't realize we had is binding us and stopping us walking in what God has for us. And there's a saying that, I don't know if you've seen it on Facebook or somewhere else, but unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. Unforgiveness is like drinking a cup of poison and hoping that the other person gets sick, what's the odds? It's not going to happen. Because unforgiveness is a bitter, a bitter um, thing that you have to deal with, and it's going to affect you and you alone. And in my experience, unforgiveness and the smallest offense can lock us away from or bind us in a way where we can't reach God's goodness and His promises. So if we have a look at the scripture, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14, Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 says this, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. What do I think that means for us in this context? God will allow you to be bound in a place of unfulfilled promises if you hold an offense or unforgiveness with someone else. Is he doing it because he's mad and grumpy and doesn't like you? No, because he's given us the answer. It's the byproduct of our choice to hold on to an unforgiveness. And really simply... To get out of this, oh no, hang on, look, we've got another scripture. 1 John, 1 John 1 verse 9. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. So we can say one thing, but our heart will say another. So unforgiveness is a, is a, is a weapon or it's a, 
it's a tool that the devil uses to lock us in a place. And, and so I, ask, I just help people by asking this simple question. You know, I get them to um, close their eyes. And I just, uh, let's just say we're facing a specific problem and they're just wrestling and they can't quite get the answer locked in their hearts. And I just say, well, close your eyes. Just pray after me. Father God, is there someone I to forgive in this area in order that I would find freedom? And if there is, God will give you a name. He'll show you a situation. He'll remind you of, a, of, a, of an event in your life. And, and, and when he does this, he's not casting judgment on them. And he's not, he's not necessarily inflating the problem. He's just showing you that there's an issue in your heart that you haven't let go of. So if we say, um, say I'm working with someone and they've got a real problem with um, just always uh, making a simple mistake in their um, taxes. And I say, okay, let's just see if there's someone you need to forgive here because this is a repeat, there's a pattern, we need to go after this. So we close our eyes, we say, okay, God, Thank you that you like to guide us. And we say, Father God, is there someone that I need to forgive to find freedom in this area of my life? And boom. Suddenly they open their eyes like dishes and they look at me and they go, <gasps> and I say, why? And they say, I just saw a picture of someone. And I say, who is it? I say, it was my maths teacher. Well, what did they do? Oh, well, I remember clearly the day that they, they just ridiculed me in the class because I made mistakes because I couldn't do simple mathematics. I'm like, well, maybe that's why you keep stuffing up your tax return. Well, let's just forgive them, because if God showed you, it's because there's a reason. We're not, we're not debating the situation. I'm not getting into the details and digging up the drudge and, and getting their emotions all worked up. I'm like, well, God showed you. Let's fix it. So we close our eyes, and I say, okay, God, let's pray. So I choose to forgive that person for the offense they caused against me and the pain and the harm and the hurt and the consequences in my life. I forgive them for all of that. And I hand over to God all the feeling of, in, in, um, um, of, of feeling of shame, and I hand over the feelings of being inadequate, and I hand over, even hand over being incompetent, and I ask God to take it away so it doesn't affect me anymore, and I ask God to tell me what's true. And God will minister healing in that space, in that moment, to that person, because he's taken away the offense because we've said we've forgiven them. And he's replaced it with something that is, you know, well, now you've got, you don't have to do maths because you've got technology. It sounds simple, but the amount of times that one little offense has been holding someone back, I see it all the time. So it's worth asking God the question. In the year of my finances, is there someone I need to forgive? That would set me free from what I'm experiencing. So we want to do that now, just in case God wants to minister in the moment. Because remember, we, we have built an environment here of faith for God to minister His love and grace to set people free. And I have found time and time again that this is a very simple transaction. There's no wailing, there's no gnashing of teeth, there's no foaming at the mouth or levitation. If that happens next to you, all the back down to the seat. It's totally okay. I make light of it because this, it's amazing how simple this is. But it's how powerful the bondage is that stops people from finding freedom. That's what's frustrating. So everybody, if you're willing, close your eyes. And we thank God that he's in the room with his grace and love and wanting to lead people into freedom. And we ask now, God, that you'd just reveal things to us in the ear of our finances. God, is there someone that I need to forgive in order that I would find freedom in this area of my life? So if God's showing you someone, then the process that we use is this. Father God, I choose to forgive that person for the offense that they caused and the harm that was done in my life or the way they made me feel. And God, I hand over to you the offense and I hand over to you the feelings and I even hand over to you the consequences. And I ask you that they would no longer limit me or hold me back in any way. 
And God, in place of that, I'd ask that you give me a gift, that you'd show me the way to walk in my newfound freedom. What would you like to say to me in this area? It's possible God's going to say something to you. I would make a, you know, these are things you want to make a note of on your phone or in your notebook if you brought one. Because God is giving you specific keys to help you walk in a different way. One of the other things that we can do here, and we will, because Jamie's just reminded me, is, uh, and, and so I'm going to say something that might challenge you theologically, but let's not debate it now. But what I, what I find sometimes is we have to, uh, the wording I'm going to use is we have to forgive God. Now, God doesn't make mistakes. God does not sin. But sometimes the way he deals with us is not what we expect. So the way I'd probably word it is, God, I'm going to let go of my expectation of what you did or should have done, what I thought you should have done. You know, because sometimes we get angry at God. I don't know, well, I don't know about you, but sometimes you get a, yeah, stomp your foot and have a shouting match. I don't know, do you pray like that? God, you didn't do it the way I thought you would. God, you let me down. God, you didn't pay that bill or rescue me from that, that mess I made. And I'm angry at you, God, because you didn't do it like I said you should. Just me? Okay, All right. But what you're doing there is you're not, you're not saying, I forgive you, God, because God made a mistake. You're saying, God, I'm letting go of that frustration when you know what's best and I don't. Do you understand what I'm saying? So just close your eyes. And if you feel you've ever had an instance where you got angry at God because he didn't do it your way, then I want you to just, uh, well, you can apologize, but I want you to let go of, remember, we're letting go of an offense. So God, if I took an offense against you, I'm going to let go of that right now. And I'm going to give it to you, God. I'm saying I'm sorry for getting grumpy and yelling at you. But I don't want this offense to hurt me any longer. So I give it to you and ask you to take it away. And God, would you tell me something that's true instead? I was helping someone once, and they had been through significant issues. And um, God said to them, you thought I wasn't there when you were in trouble. And they were like, well, that's right, God, you weren't, because I was in pain. And God says, no. So we asked God to show them where he was in their pain. And just, again, through the power of prayer, God showed them that in the midst of that pain, he was standing beside them, not to stop the pain, but to love them through the pain. And it gave them a totally different picture of God. Not that he would always stop pain, but that he would love us in the pain. And that can change our perspective and the way we view the world and the way we view God. Because God isn't a vending machine, and he doesn't do things always the way we want him to, but he works all things for good for all people who are called by his name. So what we're doing is we're just walking through an exercise where we might choose to let go of an offense, particularly in, a, in, in forgiving someone else, but sometimes letting go of grumpiness with God. Okay. You remember how I talked about um, setting the captives free? One of the big things that keeps us captive is sins that's not done by us, but that it's done around us. And we can be affected by generational bondage. So that is the sins of our fathers or forefathers, and by that I mean parents. And we can have this hereditary thing that binds us up and affects us and consequently our children. So one of the things that I like to do in this area is just um, working through a simple prayer that redeems us from anything that would be hurting us. And it's very simple. Okay, so what I'm going to do, rather than dig into it, I'm just going to pray that prayer, 
And if you want to, you can pray that prayer with me. Okay? Let's check if there's anything else I need to say there. No. Okay. So we're going to break the cycles of poverty and failure that may be affecting you and causing you to be a captive. Okay? So if you want to walk through this, then just um, uh, close your eyes and we'll, we'll, we'll walk through this prayer. And um, maybe you could say it after me, but you might say it out loud or under your breath. It's totally up to you. It'd be good for everyone to do. So we say, God, we thank you that you're the father of freedom. And God, I ask you to place the blood of Jesus between me and my parents and between my parents and my grandparents. In applying the blood of Jesus, I'm breaking the power of any generational bondage that may causing me to be a captive. I also ask you, God, to place the blood of Jesus between me and my children and my children's children so that any generational curses would not flow down the line. And I thank you, God, that you set generations free, that we will be no longer limited, that we'll be no longer bound, no longer in cycles of poverty or failure. But from this day forward, we are set free from the effects of those things that were done before us. And we receive this freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Yeah, you can say thank you for the freedom that God just gave you. Um, there's a ministry called Elijah House that friends of mine are involved with. Uh, there's a 30-minute prayer that they do to break generational, and it's very powerful. So if you want to go uh, looking for that, then we can help with that. If you think um, there's specific things that, that God shows you, like um, um, sometimes we will specifically spend time breaking the power of things like the occult or Freemasonry or other um, occult activities that have affected the family. It could be someone in your bloodline that you didn't even aware what they were doing and they were just messing around, but it's affecting you. So sometimes there's a little bit more work that we need to do. Um, but I would encourage you just to make sure that that's um, something that's dealt with because it does affect kids and grandkids, okay? The point is, sometimes things happen to us and we're not in control of it. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is where we need to talk about two things. The first thing is we will finish with this prayer, which is the same prayer that I did this morning in this morning's service, but the, we'll do that second. The first thing actually came out in our prayer meeting just before you guys arrived, and that was that Marge was talking about um, the necessity for us to remember Jesus says you can't hold new wine in old wineskins. And we did a bit of this last year in the church. We taught a series on the, the new wine that God's releasing into his church, and some of the things that we're wrestling with as a church in our community and around the people, the families, the staff, and even our facilities is I believe God is causing us to have a new paradigm, to have a new wineskin, to hold the new wine that he wants to release into our community. We have a promise that we hold on to very dearly here that God is releasing a new wine, a, a, a revival, an outpouring of his Holy Spirit into our community that there is going to be many, many people who find Jesus as their Savior uh, as a result of what God's doing. But in order for that new wine to be contained, we must have a new wineskin. And part of that wineskin is what we call paradigms. Belief structures, which I'm working through tonight, the way we see God, which I'm working through tonight, the way we see ourselves, which I'm working through tonight, and the way we pray. So one of the things that's really important for us to shake out of bad patterns is to have new paradigms. So I'm going to pray a prayer about new wineskins, and that's as a result of what happened in the prayer meeting this afternoon. Secondly, we're all going to pray this prayer. 
And some of you will be praying it again because we did it this morning. All right? Is it okay? Okay. Well, let's meet, let me pray, and then we'll, um, we'll do this other one. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you have taught us the necessity for new wineskins. And we thank you for the revelation that you have promised us new wine, a new life, an effervescence, a bubbling over. Lord, the, the picture of wine being the abundant joy that comes when we walk with you. We choose to receive that promise again tonight. We choose to receive that promise as something that God has made very clear that is for our family. But Lord, we ask that you would form us as new wineskins, that we would no longer be brittle, that we would no longer be uh, cracked or stitched together, but Lord, that we would be a new wineskin. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come as oil and that you would massage your Holy Spirit into us to make us supple and able to contain the new life that you're releasing. God, I thank you today that we remember Pentecost and the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And right now I ask again for an outflow and a baptism of the Holy Spirit for each person here, young and old that everyone, and even down to those young kids at the back, would be touched by the Holy Spirit of God, the life of God, released as it was on Pentecost, releasing gifts, releasing hope, releasing vision. God, I thank you right now, you're planting seeds in people's hearts, seeds of greatness. I think you right now you're releasing prophetic mantles on people here. God, I prophesy what you're releasing is good for the city. I thank you that some of the gifts you're releasing today will release prosperity for this town. That people would have a mandate to serve this town and make it prosperous to bring solutions, kingdom solutions, to practical secular problems. God, I pray for open doors into this community, that people in this room would walk into significant relationships with significant leaders in this community and see change and transformation because of the message of God that they carry. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you make us new? Pour your life into us, the living water afresh, I pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray this prayer together. It was quite powerful this morning, so if you weren't here, um, let's pray it with gusto. If you were here this morning, let's pray it again, because it's going to do something in each of us. So let's go. Jesus, I am your beloved, and you are mine. I am being perfected by you, the author and finisher of my faith. You have a great plan for me, beyond what I could ask or imagine, and I choose to cooperate with you. So I reopen my dreams and visions to you. I ask you to relight my hope. I ask you to release my redeemed imagination. I declare I am a prosperous soul. Amen. Like I said this morning, that phrase prosperous soul comes from 3 John and verse 2. Where John writes to the church, Beloved, I pray in all respects that you would prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. This is this internal connection with God's truth that changes our outside world. We've got to take care of our inside in order that our outside would be transformed. And that's what we spend a lot of time here doing, is helping people with that journey. Um, I just, while we were praying that prayer, I just have something to add before I move to number six, and that is this. Some of you are feeling like you have had dreams stolen. Um, one of the things that I spoke about this morning was a concept that I call broken dreams. Broken dreams happens when we experience disappointment, when we experience failure, or where we miss opportunities and we judge ourselves because of it. Broken dreams is something that the enemy uses to lock us in a cell and hold us captive or as a prisoner from the potential that God's got for us. 
And so one of the ways that I'd like to encourage you to, to break out of that, if you feel that that's you, um, then we are going to pray for you right now because um, that's what the Holy Spirit says. But um, homework would be to read Genesis 37. One of the things that I've done several times in my life is just gone back over that story of Joseph, the young boy who received a dream, two dreams in fact, from God. And I have read that as part of my devotion life in order to spur me into a place where I too could receive a dream from God. And sometimes when we've got broken dreams or we're holding on to disappointment, we lock ourselves away from what's up here. You know, we, we are closing our dreams and visions to God when in fact He wants to breathe life into them. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask, if you feel like you've got broken dreams, I just want you to stand where you are, and I'm going to pray for you. But for everybody, I'm saying the homework is to read Genesis 37, specifically about Joseph. Okay? So Holy Spirit says we've got to pray. So if you think you've got broken dreams, then just stand where you are, and we're going to pray before we move on. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your grace. God, I'm so grateful for how you pause in the midst of any, any moment to stoop down and love us where we are. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that just pressed the pause button in order that we would pray so that you can minister to these ones who have had broken dreams. Right now, we thank Jesus for his healing power. The, the life of Jesus Christ that was taken in death so that we might have eternal life with God. The beatings, the scourging of his flesh, the bruising, all for our weakness. Jesus Christ, we thank you that by your stripes we are healed. And I declare in faith over these ones now that you are bringing healing to broken dreams and broken hearts. God, we hand over to you disappointment. We hand over to you feeling of failure. We hand over to you condemnation and judgment that has been heaped on us by people that don't know the story. It's not ours to carry, and so we hand it over to you now. We release ourselves from the burden of self-imposed expectations, and we choose to yoke ourselves with Jesus and his expectation, that he is our friend, that he's walking with us, and that he will guide us into new dreams. God, I pray tonight that as these ones rest their head on their pillow, you would breathe on them. That like a rushing wind, you would flow through their heart and their mind, sparking their imagination to receive dreams from you. We thank you that you redeem our dreams. We thank you that you restore hope and you show us what might be as we give ourselves to life with you. So I bless these ones and declare them to be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Oh, look at this one. This is not an easy one. John 21, verse 17. Number six is forgiveness of self. In John 21... Jesus has already been crucified. He's been in the grave for three days, and he decided to hop out. And um, he appears to a few people, and then he goes away for a time. But in John 21, we find him on the beach, and he's cooking some fish. It's good, eh, Francois? It's always good to cook some fish. If you would bring it to my house, I could cook it. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shot, bro. Um, Peter has denied Jesus. 
And he's carrying, I believe, what this story shows us is he's carrying a burden of self-imposed shame. And in John 21, verse 17, I want to read it to you. A third time, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Why am I reading this to you? Sometimes what we carry that binds us in a place where we can't step into what God's called us into is that we haven't forgiven ourselves for the mistakes that we've made. We judge ourselves, and in the worst case, we sabotage ourselves. And we don't even know we do it. And we like shoot ourselves in the foot and wonder why we can't run fast. And, 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 it's, and it's not even something, if that's you, it's not something that you're doing cognitively. You're not aware you're doing it. But there's a bondage in place because of unforgiveness of self where you're holding yourself in cap, in, as a prisoner and you're locking yourself in this place and it's because you don't even like yourself because of what happened. And, and what does this look like? This looks like um, us not being able to receive gifts from God because we don't think we're worthy. Sometimes uh, we've been running prophetic classes or ministering prophetically, and God's wanted to love on someone and give them a prophetic word and encouragement, and they've simply just held up a brick wall and said, I can't receive that. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hang on, but God loves you, and this is what God says. And they said, yeah, but I'm not good enough for that. That is self-condemnation, and that is not from God. And I don't say that to judge anyone. I'm calling it for what it is. It is bondage that limits us from walking in the freedom that God's got for us and the abundant prosperity in our life and all areas of our life. And this is a big one. This is not one we are going to skip through quickly. Look, I don't even have any notes on it. See how bad it is. I want us to pause here for a minute because, and I want us to be sensitive because in my experience, this is a big one for people. You know, they can forgive someone that hurt them. They can walk away from broken dreams and hope that Jesus heals them. But one of the hardest things to do is to let go of unforgiveness of ourselves. So I'm going to do this real gentle. And I'm not going to rush it because I don't want you to miss out. And if God shows you something, then it's because he wants you to step away from the pain. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blanket anything and everything that could be possible into this prayer so that we can all do it and if someone next to you is having a moment, they look like they need a hug, go and give them a hug. If they want someone just sitting with them, go and sit with them. But God is wanting to break us free tonight of the self-condemnation that we heap upon ourselves. And this is... This is... um. This is going to require deliverance, but I don't say that to scare you. Still no levitation, still no manifestations, but this is true deliverance at the core, and it's super simple. And I don't say that to say that your situation isn't bad. I'm saying it because Jesus has won the victory already. So we close our eyes, and we're going to say a blanket prayer. We're going to say, Holy Spirit, I choose to forgive myself for the mistakes I've made, 
for the pain I've caused, for the consequences that have hurt others. I forgive myself and I choose to step away from the condemnation and shame that is binding me and keeping me from God's promises. I'm choosing to hand over to God these sins of the past, mistakes and errors, and even a belief system that my life has to be like this forever. I hand that lie over to God and I ask him to take it away so it doesn't limit me anymore. I also renounce the lie that I am not worthy to receive God's love. And I bind that lie and I cast it off in the name of Jesus Christ. I choose to receive the truth that I am God's child, that I am loved, that he is devoted to me, and that he sent Jesus to die for me. I choose to receive the truth that because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I am set free completely from the sins of the past. I am a child of God. I have received the spirit of adoption. And because of that, I am an heir to all the promises of God. Holy Spirit, would you show me right now something that reminds me how much you love me? So I'm going to share with you what God showed me. Because it doesn't matter who you are, this is always real. And the reason I'm doing this is to, to demonstrate with you how I've learned to live with God. So this is normal for me. I do this all the time. And um, I might look like I've got it all together, but I've got some stuff that I always like to try and deal with as I go. Okay? So I just um, did the prayer the same as you did. And at the end of it, because I believe what I pray, right? Do you believe what you pray? Okay, cool. So I believe what I pray, and then God shows me this picture. I said, Holy Spirit, show me a picture of just how much you love me and what you, what you want me to see. And I just felt like God just opened this door and showed me a treasure room. And it was, it was a picture of his abundant goodness and all the resources of heaven that he has in his storehouse and his treasure room, and he was opening the door for me to walk into. Because the truth is, if you're a son of the house, you get to walk into the room. But perhaps because I hadn't let go of some stuff, I'd close that door, or even if it was open, I wouldn't walk through it. So in my little world, while I was doing my bit here, I'm saying, okay, I'm choosing to walk through that door. And God will give me what he trusts me with, but I can see it all. Okay? So I'm sharing that with you to help you to learn how to have these conversations with God and receive what he shows you as his truth, okay? Now I'm going to go home and write that down. I'm going to pray through it, and I'm going to be a good steward of what God's given me. But you have to do the same. You know, when I ask Holy Spirit to show me a picture, I'm fully expecting he's got a gift for me that's good because he loves me, and he loves you, and he wants to show you stuff as well, okay? Um, just with regards to forgiveness of self, this is some, sometimes something that we need to work through more than once. So what I've just shown you is a tool or a process that you can use at home. Or you could have a friend come around and, and sit with you and say, let's do this one again. And say, Holy Spirit, is there, is there anything that I'm holding against myself? Is there anything I need to hand over to you? And he will show you. He's good like that. 
And the, the thing is, we're doing what um, Kathy gave me this phrase years ago. It's called the beautiful exchange. We give him our junk and he gives us his goodness. That's a beautiful exchange right there. All right? Okay. Praise God for doing his work, yeah? I'm sorry, I have to click these things. I can't remember what I, what I did. Colossians 1, let's look at this. So number 7, we're almost there. Number 7 is removing lies of limitation. So Paul writes in Colossians 1, 11 to 14. Paul says, We pray also that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so that you'll have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Amen. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That's a good word right there. You could say amen to that. So, so removing the lies of limitation. You, you guys probably, if you've been around more than five minutes, you've heard me teach this before. Lies are things that we believe that are not true according to God. But here's what I call them. I call them little t truth. Little t because it's true for us. But it's not capital T truth because it's not true in God's world. So a lie is something that's established in us as our reality or our truth. But what we've got to do is ask God to show us those things in order that we can exchange them for what is true according to Him. And some of the most simplest um, moments of freedom that I've experienced in helping people in their finances is where we have asked God this question on the screen. Father God, what lie am I believing about my finances? So let's do that. Let's close our eyes and let's see if God says anything. So we're going to pray, Father God, what lie am I believing about my finances. I told this story recently. I don't remember which audience it was in front of, but um, there's a guy I used to know, well, I do know, and I used to spend a bit of time with him, and he had this saying. We were helping some young people, and he said this once. He said, well, you know what? It just doesn't matter who you are. You're always going to be 10 grand short. And I'm like, No. But that was his truth. It was his reality. The problem I had is he was handing it on to someone else. I'm like, oh, cut that off. Because it's actually not true. But it had become true for him. So that's an example of a, what I call a lie of limitation. It's something we believe that is real for us, but it's not God's perspective. So when we're asking God this question, we're saying, God, would you show me something that I'm believing that's not right from you? So if we just use that example, because I don't want you all to bring out your confessions right now, but the point is, let's just say we're working with this guy, and he said, well, you know, I'm always just going to be 10 grand short. Where did you read that? Okay, so God's highlighted it because he wants to dig it out. So the way that we do that is we renounce that lie. We say, okay, God, I'm choosing to renounce that lie, which means I'm saying it's no longer going to have any authority in my life. And I ask you to take it away. So it doesn't influence my belief system anymore. And instead, God, I'm going to ask you, would you tell me what is true for you so that it can become true for me? And God would say, I'm just making this up on the spot, but God might say, well, you know what? I own the cattle of a thousand hills. And what's mine is yours. I'm never 10 grand short. So neither are you. That, if you do that as a prayer, becomes a spiritual transaction by faith that changes your whole world. What if your belief system was, well, you know, we're always going to be in debt. Where did you read that in the book? Didn't we just read Deuteronomy 28? We the head and not the tail become the lender, not the borrower? Huh. Well, God, I renounce the lie that I'm always going to be in debt. I hand it over to you and I ask that they have no more power in my life anymore. 
And I'd ask you, God, that you would tell me what's true for you so that it could be true for me. God would say, well, I can show you how to pay off your debt. So you're debt free. Well, I'll choose that. Well, God, you know, we're always just going to struggle. Oh, where did you read that in the book? That's a lie. But people get bound up in that lie. Oh, well, I renounce that lie. I'm saying it has no power and authority in my life anymore. I'm handing it over to God so he can take it away and get rid of it. But I am asking God what's true for me. We've got to, we've got to challenge ourselves every moment. You've got to take captive your thoughts because thoughts become beliefs. What if you believe, well, you know what? We're just going to end up with a mortgage in our retirement. Well, where's that in the, in the book? It doesn't have to be true, but it's only true because you've made it true. And I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. I'm just going off what, what is prompted in my head here, but these are probably things that are resonating somewhere in the audience. Well, God, I'm choosing not to make that my truth anymore. I'm getting rid of it. I'm kicking it out. What's true for you, God? What do you want to be true for me? So, we're not going to do this now, because this might take you half an hour. Because what you do is you ask this question that's on the screen, Father God, what lie am I believing about my finances? And when he tells you something, you don't argue with him. Well, you can try. But you say, oh, thanks for showing me that, God. I'm going to renounce that lie which means I'm disempowering it, I'm cutting it off, I'm bounding it up, I'm getting rid of it. God, take it away. And God, would you tell me what's true so I can learn to believe it? Write it down. And then ask the question again. Oh, well, while we're on a roll, is there another lie that I'm believing about my finances? And if he tells you something, don't argue. So, oh, flip, is that wrong too? But I've believed that all my life. He goes, How's that working out for you? Well, I'm going to renounce that lie because God says it's not true. Because I don't want to have power in my life if it's not true. And I'm asking God to take it away. And God, would you tell me what's true in your world? Oh, I better write that down. And I'm going to learn how to believe that it's true. This is called walking out our freedom. So what I teach people to do is write down what God says is true. Don't write down the bad stuff. Get rid of it. Write down what God says is true. And then you pray that every day. God, here's my list. We had this meeting last week, and you said that I do not have to have a mortgage when I retire. I don't need to believe anything different. So I'm confessing that you told me this, and I'm making you responsible. And the next one on the list, God, I've believed for years that I'm an idiot when it comes to money, and I can't be trusted. But somehow you don't think that's true. So would you teach me to believe what you say is true, not what I used to think? He will. It's called discipleship. God is in the business of discipling us. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's a thing for you to do. Grab a cup of tea, grab a blank sheet of paper, and give yourself half an hour. And just ask God to show you these things and see what he says. Okay, moving on, number eight. Hope restored. Acts. I just read that. One of the things around hope is, um, oh no, that's different. Acts 20, I just read a different chapter. This is, I remember now. It's getting late. It's been a long day. Okay. Sorry guys, I'm just catching up with myself. Acts 20 verse 22 has a little phrase in it that my friend taught me years ago that's uh, quite a powerful thing. So Paul goes back to Macedonia and to Greece on his third missions trip. And now, if you remember the story of Paul, the heat gets turned up every time he goes on a trip. And by that I mean more persecution, more pain, and a clearer picture of what the end looks like. And it wasn't good. Remember? And Paul says, 
Stuff it. I'm going anyway. My words, not his. And he says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. I am now bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Hallelujah. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Why did I read that to you? That little phrase in the beginning of Acts chapter 20, verse 22, I am bound in the Spirit to go. One of the things that will restore hope in your life is to have a revelation from God of what you are bound in the Spirit to do. This morning I called this having something bigger than you to focus on. A mission that is bigger than you that you can give your life to. What is your compelling mission that you are bound in the Spirit to walk in? God's got one for everyone. Most people just don't ask. But this little phrase, bound in the Spirit, is like, uh, you know, when Eugene and I would do this in a business context, we'd call, what's our driving force? What's our life mission? What would you call it, Isaac, in the work you do? Same sort of thing? Life goal? Noble cause. Thank you. So what's my noble cause? And it might sound grandiose to you, and you're sitting there in the, in the lie, and your head is saying, well, it's all right for him, but I just, I'm, I'm just a little guy at the back. Well, hello, where did you learn that lie? Because we're all redeemed by the same Jesus into the same kingdom, which means none of us don't have a compelling mission or a noble cause or a driving force. And one of the things that causes us to lose hope is we think that there's no reason for us to do anything other than survive. You know what, if I could just get through this month, well, if I could just get to the end of the year, everything will be okay. Next year will be better. I know it won't. It'll be Groundhog Day. If you don't have this bound in spirit that Jesus has given you, like Paul had, then you are in Groundhog Day. You know what I mean by that? Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. And that's not the life Jesus has got for you. So one of the things that I think um, would be helpful as a key to finding freedom is to actually have a serious heart-to-heart -heart chat with God about this and say, God, Paul had a mission. Timothy got a mission. What have you got for me? And actually believe that he has something for you. Do not, if you, if you sit there and you think, well, you know what, you know, like I'm not really qualified or I'm too old or I, I don't have enough money or I couldn't possibly do that, then just go and find online, just Google to find the story of a lady who became Mother Teresa. You read that story and then tell me that you've got less than she did. Present me the evidence and we'll have a little chat. But Mother Teresa, who was not known by that name originally, I can't remember her original name, she was a little nun in a convent, and God gave her a mission. She went to Calcutta, and the rest is history, they say. But if you think you've got less than she had when she started, I'd like you to present me the evidence. What I'm saying is you have more than her. And she would say to you if she was here, Go and find your own Calcutta. That means to be bound in the spirit to something that God's calling you into. And when you have that, it will give you hope. And when you have hope, you can do anything. Money is no longer the issue. Because money's not the problem. You are. I'm saying this to be positive. Find something that can captivate you, that is bigger than you, and give your life to it, and your financial troubles will be changed completely. Yeah. I don't want to press that one too hard, but I would encourage you to think about it.
The final one is extravagant generosity. This morning, I will read the verse first, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your hearts how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And verse 8 says, and God will generously provide all you need, then you'll have always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. This morning I told a, a little story about the spirit of mammon and how it can bind us and catch our heart and lock us into a, a place that's not fruitful. Mammon is, um, is a spirit where we think more will help us or that if only we would take care of ourselves first, we could then take care of others. That's a lie. That's the spirit of mammon. And mammon will get your heart and it will bind you and lock you into a place that gets worse and worse and worse. When I find someone in this situation, and I found many, including myself, because my testimony is on the podcast from this morning, there is one antidote that I have found to be the most effective way to unlock you and set you free instantly from the spirit of mammon, and that is called extravagant generosity. Numbers aren't important because everyone's situation is different. If you read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul says, don't give more than you have. Give in proportion to what you have, but be obedient in what God asks you to give. And my experience, God will always ask you to give something that will cost you. It might cost you in what I call opportunity cost. You might say, but God, I was saving that money for a brand new whatever. He says, I know. And that brand new whatever has got your heart. And you give me that money, your heart will be set free. I mean, that's called sacrifice. But it is the only way that I know to break the spirit of mammon. And if you read the scriptures, in verse 8, it says, And God will generously provide all you need, and then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. When was the last time that you gave an extravagant gift to break the power of mammon in your life? You don't have to answer that. But, um, you know, as a church, uh, it's easy for us to stand here and talk about this because we're fully dependent on people being generous. But there's not one leader that I know that talks like this that hasn't got a testimony of their own. And, I, you know, I don't have time to go into details, but Kathy and I have walked this journey for quite a few years now. And I can only stand here and, and expect you to be generous because I expect it of us first. And it's not right to talk numbers, and it's not relevant because everyone's situation is different. But you can ask the elders, because I do talk to them about numbers. And I do be open about what we're doing, because I'm accountable to them. And I hope they would say, yeah, he'll practice what he preaches. Every time. Because I can't ask you if I'm not prepared to ask myself. But again, it's not about the numbers, it's about the heart. If you really want to break out of this, ask God to show you how to be generous and in what area. And it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be like, that one will be like pulling teeth. But God always does it with good in mind. I want to finish tonight with, um, I'm just asking God if we uh, finish the, notes, and I think we are, because I've given you quite a lot tonight, and um, I'm aware that this doesn't always just, this is not just a one, click your fingers, and hey, you can walk out at eight o'clock and everything's fixed. Um, In my experience, that the journey that starts now is you walking and learning how to walk in freedom. You are going to need to learn how to think differently based on what God said to you tonight, and that call is retraining your thinking from the beliefs that God's planting in you. And that is a journey. That is not an instant fix. All right? So what I'd encourage you to do is to, um, we'll make sure the podcast is up this week, and we'll put these slides attached to it 
so that you have the questions and the prayers and the scriptures. You can listen to it, and you can go through some of those prayers again. But what I want to do is I want to finish. I just got another song, and I want to finish with the song really just to lock in what God's done for us. It's a song that's well known to all of us, and it speaks about the identity and the character of God who is a good father to us all. Yes, Richard. We can, we can mute that, and we can see what happens. Yep, that's a good, good thing to talk about. One of the things that I think is really powerful with what Richard's suggesting is the power of testimony and the spirit of prophecy that's released when we share testimony. But what it also does, which is why I get excited about it, is it creates accountability. I don't know if I'll get the quote right. I read it this morning from a book. There's a difference between believing God can do something and actually trusting him to do it. And trust is an action word that involves risk. If you're going to trust God in the area of your finances, you're going to need to step into a place of vulnerability and risk, which means you could fail. But that means you are putting yourself in God's hands and trusting that he will keep you safe and protect you and guide you along the way. Is that a safe choice? No. Life of faith is spelled R-I-S-K. So we're going to have to move into that space if we really want to grow ourselves. But you're not exposing yourself to me, you're exposing yourself to God and counting on Him. All right. So the idea behind uh, having testimonies to share around finances is really exciting because it means someone's got to take some risk by trusting in God. And that excites me because when people in our church do that, our community will be blessed. It's late. Okay, let's play the song and just, just ask God to anchor these things in you. All right, this is time for you and Him. He's, there's a lot that He's done tonight. But all we're doing is saying, God, would you really wrap your arms around me as my Father? Would you wrap me in your love? And would you, would you plant deep those seeds of truth that you've given me tonight? Because you are a Father who loves me. You are a Father who keeps me safe, provides for me, protects me, and calls me child. 